Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back. back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? you tried How do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? The Whitehaven Body Snatcher by Tony Walker I rang the buzzer at the front door of the house on Foxhouses Road with my elbow. Perhaps you know the house. It's one of those big old Victorian houses now divided into low-rent flats owned by some buy-to-let speculator who lives in London and has it managed by West Cumbrian properties. The buzzer fizzed like a fly on a zapper, and at first she didn't answer. I stood there and waited and thought she wasn't going to, and then I heard her tremulous voice. Hello? I cleared my throat. Hi, is that Molly? Her youngish female voice said, Are are you from the mental health team? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Are you expecting me? I didn't know when it would be. I wasn't expecting you this afternoon. Well, we can't be specific about time, you know, because of our workload, but... Here I am. Uh, Listen, can I come in? She hesitated. I said, I can't help you, Molly, if you don't let me in. Lots of the people in these multi-occupancy houses have problems. They're all poor and dependent on benefits. Lots of them have alcohol or drug problems. Most of them are mentally ill. So this girl's name was Molly Luthwaite. She was local, I'd done my research, I knew she'd lost touch with her family, some half-remembered dispute over something or other fueled by drink at a funeral that ended in her mother hitting her and her storming out. There had been two or three abusive boyfriends who drifted in and out of her life. Very sad. Very common. Molly pressed the button upstairs and the door clicked unlocked. Again, with my elbow, I took the handle, pushed it down and opened the door. What with Covid, you can't be too careful. I looked around the entry hall and my nose wrinkled. The shabby lobby smelled of mould and sweat and piss. Fairly standard. I'd been here before to see other residents. At the bottom of the stairs, there was a shelf with a plastic plant on it and heaps of junk mail had fallen onto the floor and someone had tidied them away with their foot. They were mainly bills and catalogues addressed to people who'd moved on. Molly's flat was upstairs. I went up the first flight and then the second. That's where she was, flat 21. I walked along the sticky carpet of the hall and arrived at her door. The door was open and she was looking out with one eye. She looked to be about 5'2 and very pale, as if she avoided the sun and she stood like she was timid by nature. I put on my cheery voice. Hiya, Molly. Can I come in? Molly didn't speak, but she opened the door a foot. She looked unhealthy. Her hair was badly dyed black, and her roots showed brown. She wore a black cardigan whose sleeves had ridden up on their own. And on the forearms I saw a tattoo of a rose, a tattoo of the Joker, and lots of self-harm scars. The older cuts were shiny white lines, the new ones angry and red. Come in, she whispered. I stepped inside. The flat was small and untidy. There were cheap pictures on the wall, the kind you see in charity shops. They didn't fit her goth look, as threadbare and faded as that was, and I guessed they'd been there when she moved in and she couldn't work up the motivation to replace them. Worn curtains were dragged across the window, cutting out what little daylight there was on that grey October day, but there probably wasn't much of a view anyway. Dirty mugs sat in a row like Humpty Dumpty and his men on the sideboard. The sideboard's mirror was cracked. The room was stiflingly hot. An old gas fire against the wall hissed, looking likely to be leaking carbon monoxide into the room along with its ghastly heat. The same pervasive stink of neglect as the rest of the building filled the air, but the odour of cheap joss sticks overlay it. Nag Champa, I thought, and I wasn't sure if that was an improvement. Me? I prefer my poverty plain, not covered over with cheap scent. That way, everyone knows how things stand. 
Do you want to sit down? she said. I looked around the room. There was a two-seater sofa, again probably from the British Heart Foundation, and third or fourth hand, and two armchairs that didn't match. At least she didn't have cats. I sat. The room was unbearably warm. Will you take your coat off? I shook my head. No, I'm fine. So, Molly, like I said, I came as soon as I could. How can I help? She stared at me. Please, go on, I said. She blurted. There's a man comes into this house who steals bodies. I've heard plenty of things like this in my time. My gaze didn't flicker as I studied her face, the tremor of the lips, the eyes downturned. I said, right, he comes into the house. Yes. Into your room? No, not yet. Mm, but he steals bodies. Yes. Okay, well, just to help me understand, in what way does he steal them? She said, he takes them over. I, I hear him do it in the night. He opens them up with his sharp fingers, and when they're hollow, he, he puts on their skin. He puts on their skin. Okay. But how do you know that? I, I, I just know. But you can't see him do it, I tilted my head. Or, or, or can you? No, I can't see it. But I hear him do it. The, the walls are thin. I, I hear him talking to them. He asks them lots of questions first. Lots of questions until he gets to know them. And then they relax. And they think he's just interested in them. Like he cares. And when they're relaxed, he begins. He begins. Explain. Like I said, he begins to open them. Okay. I tried a different tack. So, you hear them talking, you hear him asking them questions. She nodded rapidly, blinking. Her eyes filmed with moisture and she rubbed them with the back of her fingers and her tears and mascara smeared her hands, but she trailed them down her cheeks, leaving stains that made her look like a sad panda. Do you have a tissue? I tried to put her at her ease, I joked. I always make people cry, I don't mean to, they just do. She reached over to the top of a cabinet near her threadbare armchair and plucked out a tissue. I guessed she did a lot of crying. She took one, then two, and dried her eyes. She squeezed tight hold of the tissues in her fist. It meant something to her. Are you okay, I said. I just saw how upset you were. Do you feel you can go on? She nodded, swallowed. It seemed she wanted to go on. I said, so, um, you were saying how you hear him talking. By the way, you don't need to tell me any of this if it upsets you. She sighed, no, I'll tell you. I want the help. Okay, well, it helps me understand what's going on with you, and then I know how I can help. Tell me a bit more. She didn't meet my eyes. Yes, he cuts them open with these long, dirty nails. Dirty nails. But you said you couldn't see him. I know his nails are dirty and long and sharp. We dried blood under them. Okay. First, he relaxes them. Then, when he's got them quiet, he asks them to turn down the light. Turn down the light. Why does he do that? So they can't see his hands. The hands would give the game away. He only gets out his hands once he's turned down the light. Until this point, he's kept his hands in his pocket. And when he's asked them lots of questions and they feel like he's really interested in them, they just drop their guard and they turn down the light. And in the dark, he starts to work on them. Hmm. They just let him do it. Yes, but he, he does it gently at first, in, in the low light, so they don't even realise what he's doing and, and, until it open, uh, and it's too late. He starts with the tummy and unbuttons their shirt, and, and his nails are like knives, uh, and they let him do it. But I don't see why they let him. Because he gets their confidence. 
He pretends to be someone who really cares. They're the sort of people who nobody cares about. And they're so hungry for someone's care that they're, they're easy to fool. I'm sure someone cares about them. She shook her head. She was very definite. No, they're people who are sick. They're alcoholics or they're depressed or they've got personality disorders. Nobody wants them. Nobody ever wanted them. Everybody's left them alone. Most of the time their own parents didn't want them and now they live in these little flats in town where the council puts them because they're homeless and they get these little flats and the council stuffs all the waifs and strays together so they don't bother decent people. And all the people with anxiety problems and mental health get put with the druggies and then the gangsters come and sell them drugs and break into their houses and steal their stuff. But why don't they go to the police if this happens? Because the police don't believe people like them, people like me. I sat back. So you, you consider yourself one of these people? She looked at me like she'd probably looked at all the doctors and police and social workers and teachers and magistrates and probation officers and debt counsellors all her life. To her, they were all the same. Smiling do-gooders who didn't really care. They'd come into her house to see her mother when she was a kid and they pretended they cared, but they were really checking on little Molly to make sure her mother wasn't battering her, which she probably was, or her boyfriend was. It's all so predictable and sad, and it can't be stopped. I knew Molly's type. I knew all those professionals she'd seen, all the kind teachers who tried to help her at school, then the job advisors trying to get her work she could never do, and the citizens' advice people helping her with her debt, and the drug and alcohol workers helping her with her addictions, and the community police officers and problem solvers and well-being counsellors and CBT therapists helping her with her anxiety. And they always cocked their heads and listened to her inexhaustible tales of woe, knowing they could do nothing to help her make her life even bearable. And they spoke softly of compassion and resilience building and cognitive therapy and antidepressants, and they sanctioned her benefits and left her to her vicious neighbours and psychopathic boyfriends. Oh yes, I knew Molly's world. I knew so many like her. We'd gone quiet. Molly sat. I think... She was sobbing under her breath, just a little sound, like a mouse. Just give me a bit more detail, I said. I still don't understand how you know he's doing this when you can't see him do it. I sense it. He does it in the rooms around here. Like I said, the walls are thin. The, the feelings come right through them. I said, OK. Do you ever see this man in the house, in the communal areas, when he's not hurting your neighbours? Maybe you bump into him in the stairs. Yes, sometimes I see him. And, and, and what's he like? Is he nasty? She shook her head. No, he always smiles and asks how I am. He says, I hope you're OK, Molly. You look sad. She stopped. He's got a shirt like yours. I shrugged. This shirt? It's a cheap Primark shirt. I bet plenty of people have got shirts like this. Probably, she said. So, so what does he look like? Can you describe him? He always changes. He, he always looks like the last one he opened up. I said, how does he do that? He puts on their skin and their face so that no one would know he wasn't them, not even their own mothers. But they don't have mothers and all their friends are always drunk or off their faces on drugs. So there's nobody going to come to help them. I said, Molly, have you ever had experiences like this before? What do you mean? Well, this, it, it's pretty unusual. Sensing someone doing something like this. I, I mean, it, it, it's pretty serious. If it's true. Her eyes narrowed. Of course it's true. I'm not crackers. I smiled, we don't use words like that, Molly, anymore. So you do think I'm crackers? I never said that. But it is serious what you're accusing this man of. We need to be sure. You're basically accusing this man of murder. It isn't murder. It's theft. 
He steals their skins and then he keeps them somewhere. Okay. If this is true, why hasn't he done it to you? She studied the hands clasped together on her knees, one holding a scrumpled up tissue. He's just waiting. He's waiting to put me at my ease. Like you said, he pretends to care about them, because nobody really cares about us. We're not stupid. We know folk despise us. They think we're broken biscuits. They think we're a waste of space. That's harsh. It's true. I leaned forward. Molly, I, I really want to help you. She said, Are you sure you don't want to take your coat off? Don't change the subject. I said I wanted to help you. She looked at me. Her cheeks were wet. She said, Maybe you do. I, I think life's really hard for you, Molly. It is. I think you've suffered a lot. She nodded, crying freely now. I said, ever since you were a little girl, and it's not fair. You never ask for a life like this. No. I don't know what you've done to deserve this suffering. I haven't done anything. I've never hurt anyone. I know you haven't. None of this is your fault, really. She sighed heavily. She seemed to settle a little. She said, maybe you do care. You seem nice. You're not like the others. You're the first one who's really listened to me. I'm, I'm glad you feel that. Then she started. Oh, I should have asked for your ID before I let you in. Don't worry, I've got ID. Do you want to see it? She shook her head. No, I trust you now. I can show you my ID. It's not a problem. I looked at the wall. Is that light on the dimmer switch? She nodded. Do you mind turning the light down a little? It's just a little bit bright in here. No, no, it's okay. It just makes it more relaxing, if it's a little darker. Sure, I, I will. She put the tissue up to her nose and stood up from the chair. She stepped over to the wall and twisted the dimmer down. Standing there, she said, What did you say your name was? I didn't, uh, but I'm called Thomas Jardine. She didn't look disturbed. She seemed resigned. In a quiet voice, she said, that That's what they call him. Thomas Jardine, that, that's his name. Yes, but I don't look like him, do I? She relaxed. No, good. Do you trust me to help you? She nodded. I trust you to help me. I said, I'm really pleased, Molly. Anyway, turn the light down a bit more. It was quite dark now. And for the first time, I took my hands out of my coat pockets. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. That way you help me make more stories for you and get access to a patron's only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. So that was the White Heaven Body Snatcher by Tony Walker. That's me. And it was a particularly nasty story. So I, on purpose, so I uh, will tell you a little bit about the, how it's come about. So it is now the 20th of October. On the 27th of October, we were doing our first um, live reading of the winter in uh, Whitehaven, where I work in a GP practice. And um, I'm, with me will be Jonathan um, Sharp of the Hartwood Institute, who is behind the music at the beginning of the podcast. And he does loads of music. He's um, a hauntologist, so kind of ambient electronic, but definitely I got in touch with him because he does kind of quite unsettling music in lots of ways, and that's what I was looking for. So, and Ben Brinnicum, who's an actor, and he will be there with me, and he's going to read some stories. We might do three stories or four stories. Well, pre-COVID, I had written quite a lot of ghost stories and horror stories and monster stories, which became Cumbrian ghost stories and then more Cumbrian ghost stories. To be truthful, more Cumbrian ghost stories haven't had much of an outing. Anyway, I said to um, the lads, I said, um, what should we do for this? We're going to get an audience. And do we want to be traditional or, you know, like do traditional folk stories? I, I re write all the stories, but I can do them. I've got one called The Screaming Skulls of St. B. So they have to be local as well. I'll say something about that in a minute. But, so, but Jonathan said, I said, are we going traditional? Are we going scary? And he said, go scary. So it came to me, this horrible story. It's like it was channeled from somewhere dark. 
And um, the other one is the Screaming Skulls of St. Bees, and it's a Screaming Skull story. It's completely made up, but I've written it as if it were, and I've, I've placed it locally in St. Bees, which is near Whitehaven, um, to, and it is as if it were a real folk story, but it isn't. I made it up. Uh, and that's more like a traditional one. That's not particularly scary as such, but it's got that uh, Screaming Skull motif. I don't know if you know, there are a number of um, houses across, I don't know if it's all of England, certainly lots in Cumbria, and I think in Yorkshire, and maybe just the north of England, and Garstang as well, I think, in Lancashire. So anyway, it, it, certainly the north of England, the traditions that are skulls that scream, okay? And um, so that, that's using that. That isn't massively scary. And then I'm probably going to rehash one, probably the Dalton Vampire. So before I go back to this story, I want to say something about the... I've got a very strong sense of place. I always have. I always like to... Um, I like stories with a sense of place, and I've always tried to set my stories, and the, inevitably the places I know well. So it's Cumbria, which I know well, but also I put them in Wales, um, where I lived for a long time, and in London, where I lived for seven years and in Edinburgh, where my, my dad's family are from. And so, you know, these are places I know. And, and, the, and it all started because I used to write kind of general ghost stories and horror stories. And uh, can you believe it? But nobody bought them. Can you believe it? And I suppose the thing is you put them for sale and people don't know who you are and they don't know if they'll like them. And so there's no hook, really. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, who's this guy? And I thought I had this brilliant idea. I would um, do geographically linked stories I would do Cumbrian ghost stories because a lot of people come to Cumbria on holiday to the Lake District. And so I thought, oh, well, that's a hook, isn't it? And I know the place. And then I did London horror stories because I knew London pretty well. I used to walk up and down it. Uh, and I, prob I may do some Welsh ones. I've got a, three or four Welsh-based stories. Um, I live in Wales about 15 years. So that's it. It has, this is a kind of a digression. It has struck me that there would be a market for like New Orleans ghost stories or um, New York ghost stories or, you know, something like Los Angeles ghost stories where there's an urban population. I can't write them in German or else it'd be, you know, I'd do Berlin ghost stories. I'd love to do Venice ghost stories or Prague ghost stories, but there, I don't sure there is such a tradition of ghost stories in, in non-English speaking literature. I know there are some weird tales. The Germans have got lots of weird tales and, Yes, yeah, so of the Czechs, actually, and something of the Italians. But, but you know, um, so it struck me I should get into publishing. So if any of you can write me a, let's say, a New York ghost story, if you know New York or, or another big city with a, it's going to have population so that people will pick it up. I think that's a good marketing idea. Anyway, back to this story. So you know why it's set in Whitehaven? Because I'm doing a live reading in Whitehaven. I had to write a story particularly for Whitehaven um, to entertain the people who are going there so that they feel this is a local connection. So it could have been set in any grim post-industrial wasteland in Britain and possibly the rest of the world as well. But, um, you know, these, this is, could be a story from my working life. The sad truth is, most of what I say in this is absolutely true. I know so, I've had so many patients just like this. Okay, so in, they, they, they're not actually being eaten. I am not a body snatcher. Although I was thinking as I was reciting it, you know, I wonder if one could understand our role as in some way cannibalistic on these people. I don't know somebody can write a thesis on that. Actually, there are a number of people who are scholars who, who listen to this, so maybe somebody likes the idea of the, the concept of uh, mental health workers as parasites upon their patients. I think that's really interesting. I don't feel particularly parasitic. I do try and help people. Um, but it's hard because they're really hard to help for all sorts of reasons, and they have multiple deprivation. That's a fancy way of saying it, you know. They just live these miserable, miserable lives and nothing we do and nothing. And my daughters are teachers, you know, so nothing they do. And I know lots of social workers and I know debt counselors and I know drug and alcohol workers and I know GPs and I know uh, police problem solvers. The, the local police have community problem solvers. And um, I, know, I know all these people and educational psychologists and 
child and adolescent mental health workers and, you know, everybody. And they are involved with people like Molly from an early age. I, I have patients and we have discussions about whether the children should be removed because they're not fit parents, they're on drugs or they have paedophile boyfriends or vicious boyfriends or they're neglectful, you know, and it is a really, it's one job I wouldn't like to do. I remember once we were going to see a patient, we were a mental health team, and um, we went in and there was like a lynch mob round of the neighbours who were trying to protect, because the kind of communities do band together from us, the representatives of the state. And uh, we were saying that we're not the social workers, we're not the social workers. Um, and, and then the social workers arrived with police escort to remove the child. So these are grim situations. They're not easy situations for anybody involved, and I'm not suggesting they are. And one of the things I do say to my patients like this is, you know, a lot of the things he was saying is just like I talk to the patients, and I'll say to them, you know, this isn't your fault, and, and it, it by and large isn't. It, it may be, you know, we, we need to talk about, we do talk about resilience and personal responsibility, and I believe in all those things. But it's hard, you know, for people like this to find that in themselves. So this was a story from my life. And I, obviously I've spent lots of time talking to psychotic people who believe crazy things like this. Um, but of course the twist was that Molly wasn't psychotic. Ha ha. That was the twist, you see. I don't know why I'm laughing. It wasn't very funny, was it? So it was horrific, really. Hopefully it scared you, though. And hopefully you feel a bit disturbed because you're frightened to turn the light out in case... Somebody crawls up to you in the dark and with their long, sharp fingernails opens you up. There must be something very twisted about me to write stories like this. Now I'm going to have to go and see my analyst again. Um, try and work out. <laughs> anyway, happy Halloween. I'll, I'll, I'll be much more lighthearted next time. I'll, I'll do a nice fairy story. Listen, if you want to listen to a nice story, go and listen to... The Milk White Child of Ravenglass, which Ravenglass is just down the coast from Whitehaven. So that that's a very sweet story. Or, yeah, it, it is wholly sweet, I think, more or less. So as an antidote to this grim tale, go and listen to The Milk White Child of um, Ravenglass. And please spread the word, share the podcast. I've started a Bandcamp account whereby some of my stories, like the Dracula I stream Dracula um, because it's like 16 hours long, the, my narration of Dracula, and it's um, too long to, to be hosted. So I put it on a live stream. There's a little way around it that you can, but the, it was too long for the live stream, and the live stream clipped it off at about four fifths of the way through. So I've put a link through. I've put it on Bandcamp. Now, Bandcamp, you can buy it from Bandcamp, but you can also listen to it three times without paying a cent. So do that, you know, that I'm happy for you to do that. Um, I'll prefer to buy it, but if you, you know, I know people haven't got a lot of cash these days, so it's a little treat, a little Halloween treat from me to you. Go and listen to it. That's 48 hours of listening, and, and if you're not sick of it by then, you never will be. So, okay, it's over at Bandcamp. I'll probably put a link in the show notes. This is what we say at podcasts. Link in the show notes. Anyway, hope you're well. Happy Halloween.
Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some dies, come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Everybody come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Everybody come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Everybody come back.